crunch up a little bit so I can. <laughs> okay, you guys, we're going to get started. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. This is uh, the keynote event of Black History Month for Balsa. And we're really, really excited to welcome uh, Ms. Ayer Sharif here. Um, Kim is currently employed, uh, employed by Black Entertainment Television as the Associate General Counsel for Legal Affairs. As such, she oversees all legal aspects of BET's New York production activities and has responsibilities for various other corporate and production related matters. After graduating from Tulane University School of Law, Ms. Sharif began her legal career at the DC based law firm of Verner just Lipford. just do the first two. Werner Lipford. Okay. <laughs> it's Lipford so long. And five it's other ridiculous. Um, <laughs> in both the corporate tax and energy group. At, in, and in 2003, Kim transitioned to the position of Associate General Counsel for BET. She currently resides in Manhattan with her husband and one year old daughter. And she's going to tell you guys about the importance of mentoring. She's going to touch on it. But I just want to thank her because she has definitely been one of my mentors. And so I'm so excited to have her here. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. No I really appreciate it. Um, so as Aisha knows, I can just talk. So I told her that I wanted to just, you know, for maybe about 10 minutes, kind of tell you what my career path has been and then open it up to questions because I think that'll be, you know, kind of the better way to address all the questions that you guys have because I remember having a ton of things that, you know, I wanted to ask. So no holds barred after I kind of give you a little, a little background. Um, but I do want to start by saying that there are four things that you'll hear me talk about throughout this entire presentation. Um, and they're things that I think are the linchpins of, you know, basically what will take you through to your goal in terms of your career path. Um, first is always keeping an open mind. I think that's very, very important. And we tend to, as lawyers, get pigeonholed into certain paths and um, think that we have to do certain things um, in order to attain what is perceived as success. But I, I really implore you guys to keep your minds open. Um, the second thing is the ability to start to understand how to deal with organizational politics, I'll say, whether it's a law firm or a corporation that is, you know, half the battle. I mean, of course, you have to do good work, but um, there's also this element of politics that can make or break you. Um, and then thirdly, excellence. Just, you know, doing your best at whatever job you're tasked with. And then finally, and I think most importantly, networking. So I'll just kind of take you back to the beginning of my um, college career. Um, I actually started off as a pre-med major, didn't really know anything about law. Everybody in my family is doctors. So um, I, I kind of started off on this really stringent path with everything dictated for me, and I realized that it wasn't for me. So you know, I opened my mind, and I just started thinking about all the different things that I actually enjoyed um, and pieced together what ended up being a sociology and African studies dual degree. Um, and in the course of kind of making this switch from pre-med, I also got involved in a program called the After School Kids Program. And um, we as students, and I guess we were called site coordinators, we worked with children who were in the juvenile justice system, and we served as a liaison between their families, their schools, the, you know, the judge that had adjudicated their cases, um, and then, of course, the administrators of our program. And this is what really started to kind of open my mind to the possibility of becoming a lawyer. Um, and I would say, you know, also in conjunction with that, just kind of talking to other classmates and upperclassmen who were thinking about going into law really started to get me kind of settled on this path. Um, one of my very good friends, who was an upperclassman, actually went on from, I went to Georgetown undergrad. He went on from Georgetown to go to Tulane Law. And um, when I decided to apply to law schools, he um, contacted me and said, look, you know, Tulane has this great um, career services program, and I really think you should apply. And I was literally already set to go to Georgetown Law. 
I was like, you know, it's my alma mater. I'm just going to do this. No brainer. Well, again, I kept my mind open, and I um, ended up talking to a dean that was um, heading up career services at the time there. And um, he essentially said to me, look, what do I have to do to get you to come to Tulane? And of course, my answer was money. <laughs> and, but assuming that he couldn't really do that for me, I guess, you know, um, he came back to me with essentially a full ride. So um, I just really thought long and hard about it, went and visited the school, and decided to do it. And I think it was the best decision that, that I've made so far in terms of my education. While I was at Tulane, um, the focus for me was, you know, obviously on my grades and excellence, but I also did a lot of networking. And that was kind of at the hand of this dean. He would set up um, various receptions and things for students with uh, partners and associates at law firms in town. And that was very, very helpful um, in laying the foundation for me in terms of, you know, just general networking, but also this whole concept of trying to figure out how to deal with organizational politics. Um, I ended up having the opportunity to work for Werner Lipford, the firm that I ended up going to after law school, based on one of these networking events. Um, and having the opportunity to talk to some attorneys at the firm, you know, then continuing my relationship with them. And um, I worked there after my first year of law school and then went on to work for my second year and then get an offer. Um, so I really, really do suggest that you try to just talk to as many people as you can in the, the areas that you're interested in. Um, even if you think that it might be a dead end, just reaching out to someone once may, you know, down the line, end up, you know, reaping some benefits for you. So after Tulane, I went to Werner Lipford, which is in Washington, D.C., and um, again, I just, I just tried to do my best. I tried to really focus on developing a very strong work ethic. And I'm sure you've heard that <laughs> law firm life is not easy, but really, you know, putting in those hours does lay a great foundation for any path that you decide to take as a practicing attorney. So I, in addition to working really hard, went to, you know, the events that they set up for new, new associates and um, I was able to really form some strong bonds with um, some of the leaders of the firm. In particular, one person was the co-chair of the firm, and he happened to be in the energy practice area, which I knew nothing about and, frankly, really didn't have an interest in. But because I had forged this relationship with him, he actually asked to have me in his group when I came on board formally. So I ended up half-time in the energy group and then half of my time in the corporate and tax group, which was actually the area that I thought I was more interested in. Um, but being in this energy group helped me to, again, navigate these firm politics. Um, and being at a firm can be a wonderful, wonderful experience, but you can also get lost in the shuffle. So having allies and people that will look out for you and make sure that you get you know, good exposure internally as well as externally with clients is extremely important. Uh, so that's something else that I, you know, I think that you should focus on in addition to, you know, doing a good job is making sure that you're meeting the right people and asking the right questions and, and things like that. Um, while I was at Werner Lipford, I had a mentor who was a partner. And he is really the reason why I am where I am today. He ended up leaving the firm, unfortunately, right after I got there as an associate. But we stayed in touch. And um, he also, before he left, made sure that I was acquainted with his allies at the firm and made sure that you know those partners and associates knew to 
you know, kind of guide me in the right direction and um, do the things that I just talked about, you know, make sure that I'm getting the right assignments, that I was actually able to have a little client contact early on, um, all these things that are kind of intangibles but that really do make a big, big difference down the line. So um, he and I obviously stayed in touch and um, I guess about a year after I had come to the firm, he called me to say that he and a law school classmate of his were thinking about starting their own firm. And when they thought about, you know, kind of expanding and needing help, he thought about me um, straight away in terms of being one of their associates. So all he asked me to do was just to keep him informed. He said, if you're planning on making a move or anything of that sort, just call me because, you know, I want to be able to try to make you an offer to come with us. So I said, fine. You know, that was, that was easy. So I would say maybe another six months later, he called me to say that things were moving a little more quickly than they thought. And he started to, you know, kind of give me an idea of what he foresaw the firm uh, doing and where he saw me fitting in. And by the end of my second year, um, he had given me a concrete offer and asked me to come on board. So I didn't really know exactly what I'd be doing. At this point, I really had pretty much set my mind on becoming a transactional attorney. Um, so he said that that was definitely you know, something that they wanted to do at the firm, was bring on clients where they could you know, um, deal with large transactions, but he just didn't really think that that was going to happen right away. This was a very small firm. So I remember, I think I was supposed to start at the end of, the end of August, and he called me, actually while I was on vacation, <laughs> and said, you know, can you come in a few weeks early because we just got this really big client and I want you to come in and really start on the ground floor with them. And he's like, I'm not really sure if it's going to be to your liking because it's not, you know, these big transactions that you're used to working on and everything. And I was like, look, you know, I'm along for the ride. Who's the client? And he said, Black Entertainment Television. And I said, you know what? No problem. <laughs> I have no problem doing that, you know. So um, even though I was only two years out of law school, I ended up really functioning as an in-house attorney for Black Entertainment Television. And, um, you know, as I said before, I really do attribute that to him. I attribute that to the training that he gave me. I attribute it to the confidence that he had in me. And, um, you know, I also just attribute it to the fact that he really spoke on my behalf to the powers that be at Black Entertainment Television um, to really convince them that I had what it took to, to you know, take on the role that they needed me to, to fulfill. So um, again, I'm going to just bring all these four things together. You know, I always try to do my best in, you know, on every single task that was ever given to me, no matter how menial. I really attribute networking to uh, my ability to kind of move through this path. And um, I definitely kept an open mind because I did some things, you know, especially the, the energy work. And I mean, I never would have dreamed of doing that. I didn't even know what it was before I started it. So, but that still helped me to, you know, lay this foundation, get great client contact, you know, have, form these relationships with the, the real rainmakers at this firm. And all of that just helped me, you know, as I, as I went along. So, I'm actually going to stop there. I don't know if I've gone for 10 minutes, but, um, and I want to open it up to questions. Um, literally, no holds, holds barred. Um, if you have questions about what I do at BET, questions about my career path, anything, I will answer. Or I won't answer if it's too, <laughs> too personal, but you guys, can, you guys can throw it out there. How long have you been at BET now? Well, I started off in you know, this very interesting capacity where I was working for a small law firm, but I was completely seconded. So every day I went into an office at BET. So that started in actually 99. And from 99 until 2003, spring of 2003, I worked in that capacity. Um, in, I guess, towards the end of 2000, Viacom actually bought BET. 
So I worked on that deal. I was based in the DC office, which is the headquarters of VET. I worked on that deal, and then they moved me up to New York because at that point, VET started its New York presence because you know Viacom, most of its its subsidiaries are based in New York. Um, and so even though I was, you know, technically outside counsel, the deputy general counsel at the time assigned me to take over, you know, basically this new New York production facility in terms of the legal affairs. Um, so that was a very interesting position. Um, I enjoyed it, but at the same time it became frustrating because I was outside counsel. So there was only so much I could do in terms of decision making before I had to go to you know, my client and ask them to sign off on things. Um, so my increasing frustration led me actually to take a short sabbatical from BET. So from May of 2003 to November of 2003, I worked for a company called Muse. It's an entertainment data company. Um, it was kind of at the tail end of the whole, you know, internet boom. It was one of those companies that actually hung on. Um, and so I served as basically chief slash general counsel for them for that time period. Um, however, the deputy general counsel from BET came to me during that time period and said, look, you know, we really want you back. So he gave me an offer that I couldn't refuse. And I actually came truly in-house to BET in November of 2003. And so, uh, you know, I've been in that capacity for, you know, this last three, three and a half years. So part, part two, we, we often hear that, um, <coughs> you know, sort of going from a firm to, to in-house is a natural progression as far as your career goes. Can, can you help us brainstorm about things you can do after taking an in-house position? like? <clears throat> um, the, the company I used to work for, oftentimes the, the in-house lawyers would sort of um, jump over the, the legal wall, if you will, and take on you know, director positions in management or, or other capacities. Can, can you just talk about maybe what in-house lawyers do afterwards? Sure, sure. And I mean, I don't have, you know, ironclad knowledge of this because I'm still in the in-house realm, but um, that is one thing that happens very frequently. Um, and that is, you know, even if it's not necessarily within the organization, as an in-house lawyer, you deal with so many different, um, you know, attorneys, colleagues, etc. cetera. Um, and so you do have the ability to, number one, form these relationships, network, um, but also as an in-house attorney, and especially in my you know, line of work, you really do have to understand the other side of that fence. You know, if you're an attorney and you only think about the law, you really are not, you're, you're really doing a disservice to your clients because you're, you know, you're so you know, tunnel vision about things that you don't advise them in a way that will help them advance you know, their they're part of the business. You know, in my case, I'm working with the creative side. And if I were to just shut everything down because it wasn't ironclad legally, then no shows would be broadcast, you know. So you really do have to understand, you know, that business side or creative side. Um, and so, in that regard, a lot of attorneys do start to understand and know the other side of the fence so well that they, you know, someone yanks them over to the other side. So that's one way to go. Um, the other way is, you know, based on the relationships that you make with the, you know, people that you're either negotiating with or, you know, in my case, we do a lot of co-productions. So I get to work alongside, you know, third-party production companies. And sometimes, you know, attorneys get pulled either as an attorney for those outside companies or, again, you know, get pulled to the business side of one of those other of the, um, one of those other companies. Um, the other thing I have actually seen in-house attorneys do is come full circle and go back to a law firm. Um, and that normally happens, uh, again, based on this networking concept. If you, you know, do a lot of negotiations and you build these relationships, sometimes you actually end up um, building a, a potential client base for yourself. 
And if you're able to actually you know, solidify that, you can take a book of business back into a firm as you know, of counsel, a partner, et cetera. So I mean, really, sky's the limit. Keep your mind open <laughs> because you really can make of it what you want. Um, you know, if you decide not to forge relationships with outside, you know, outside people, well then, yeah, you know, maybe you can focus on jumping the line within the organization. But there are just so, so many ways that you can go, and the experience is valued across the board, firm, corporation, et cetera. What's a typical day like well, I don't know if anything is ever typical, but um, I, let me see, let me try to think of how to describe what I do in a day. When I walk in the door, I'm bombarded. <laughs> um, because in, at my production facility, we are literally pumping out shows daily. Um, some live, some are, you know, what we call live to tape, so that during the day, people are in the studio. So I'm constantly getting questions about what content they can use or incorporate in their shows, um, how they can incorporate this content into their shows. So you know, these are basically like IP issues. Um, I'm also getting questions about you know, what they can use, even things that we have shot ourselves. You know, if we go out and shoot interviews, et cetera, how can we use those? What's the length and the breadth of our ability to use that kind of content? Um, in addition to that kind of thing, I'm also constantly in negotiation on a variety of agreements. They range from you know, talent agreements to all the way to you know, service agreements and leases. Anything that is related in any way to the production of these shows comes across my desk. So, you know, there are days that I see things that I've never seen before. <laughs> and I have to, you know, either figure it out based on past experience or, you know, I have a budget that allows me to go to various, you know, different firms that we use for different subject matter and um, call on them to, you know, write a quick memo for me and so that I can just be a really quick study. Um, I also work very closely with the business and creative executives. Um, anything that they're doing. If they're you know, negotiating a new deal, um, then they will consult me. If they are working with talent and some crazy request that talent has, you know, I deal with them on that. Um, what else do I do in a day? Um, oh gosh, I don't even know. There are well, I guess a lot of my day now that I have a little bit of a staff, thank God, because I was totally overwhelmed. But um, I, you know, delve out all these different assignments. I mean, we get sometimes, you know, 40 and 50 requests for new contracts or, you know, contract reviews within, you know, the five-day week. So all of those things come past my desk. And as I said, they can range talent all the way down to, you know, services. Um, I don't know, I mean, really, sky's the limit. So bottom line is, nothing is ever typical. But that is exactly what I love about being in-house. Because you get to just put your hands in everything. Whereas, you know, not that you don't get to do that in a firm environment, but I think that you are a little bit more specialized um, if you end up, you know, in a particular practice group at a firm. Um, whereas in-house, you really have to have a, a pretty good grasp of a wide range of issues. You're not necessarily specializing. Um, you know, I guess I consider myself an entertainment lawyer, but that means that I understand contract law. I understand you know, many aspects of intellectual property. Um, you know, I'm a transactional attorney, but I also you know, do risk assessment and look at various litigation issues. Um, so that's what makes it really fun to me, is that you really get to, you know, deal with a lot of different issues, but you also have to be pretty creative. You have to understand how to kind of make it all gel and, you know, really think about your end result, which for me is, you know, television shows and the ability for, you know, the, the creative and business people to get exactly what they want on the air on the air.
ladies first. Oh. <laughs> I was just wondering if you're able to do the bono work um, and how <coughs> I do not do pro bono work through my company, but I do make time just because it's very important to me to do various activities. And it's, I don't necessarily do pro bono legal work you know, all the time. I will try to find more discrete projects that I can work on in that regard, um, and then do you know, just volunteer work otherwise. But I actually don't know of many corporations that truly sponsor pro bono work for their attorneys. It's hard because you're really, really busy. And so for, you know, for your boss to say, yeah, let's, you know, get everybody together and we'll also work on, you know, this pro bono project in the midst of, you know, trying to keep our heads above water with all these, you know, these other matters. It's difficult. So I you know, not that it doesn't happen out there in an in-house environment, but I don't really know of, you know, kind of the same way that a firm would sponsor pro bono work. I don't know of that happening in-house. So, possible. Um, dealing with everything that you deal with on a daily basis, um, how would you recommend making oneself more attractive in terms of being a candidate to go in-house? Right. Um, generally, these, these law firms like to have us go one way or the other in terms of litigation or corporate, and you know, sometimes a lot of people kind of shuffle us into a specific department. Right. Um, so, in terms of, yeah. you know, what do you, I guess, also, like, who generally goes and out with them more, like, like, what side and what background do they normally have? Okay, so I'll start actually with the first part because. It actually likens a little bit back to her issue or her question about pro bono work because that is one way for you to expand your repertoire. Is you know if you're in ha if you're at a firm, I'm sorry, and you're doing transactional work, but you really want to know how litigators do their job. Um, you know there are various organizations in my field. There is an organization called the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, and they do extensive training. And so, you know, me not being a, a litigation attorney, I could go and sign up to be a volunteer lawyer for the arts, <laughs> and I would be trained to deal with, you know, the various litigation matters that might come up in that context. So that's something that you can, you know, actually put on your resume. Um, it's training, it would be practical experience, um, but it is something that's, you know, really outside the lines of what you may be um, relegated to at your firm. And the other thing is just within your firm environment, especially when you're a young attorney, you always have the opportunity to go and, you know, talk to people in other groups and get discrete, discrete projects. You know, maybe something that won't take up too much of your time, but, you know, a way to kind of introduce yourself to other subject matter. And um, I highly recommend that because that's also a way to network. It's a way to you know make sure that you are meeting, you know, kind of the the people at your firm, um, so that if you know some opportunity comes up, they'll think of you as opposed to you just being, you know, kind of pigeonholed into you know knowing the people that are in your group. Um, so now on to the second part, um, what can you do to kind of you know I guess prepare yourself for. I guess you know what you're saying is a variety of experience, so that you can almost sell yourself as a generalist. Is that pretty much what the question is? Um, CLEs, huge. You know, um, you should also try to involve yourself in various trade organizations if you have an area of the law that you're interested in. Um, seek out you know different associations that focus on those areas or. You know, if you're looking at kind of wider range um, bar associations, look at the, the different subsections that deal with particular subject matter that you're interested in. Um, you know, corporations understand that you can only get so much exposure and experience. Um, so it's really a matter of selling yourself as, you know, a quote unquote expert in your area. But, you know, as someone who also does have a bit of experience, you know, dabbling in different things um, so that they understand that you at least, you know, have the capacity to 
understand these areas that are outside of your, your specialist realm um, and that that's what you actually want to do. You want to expand your repertoire. Um, I don't really know what to say, you know, in terms of like law school and what to do. I know people ask me, well, what classes should I take? Take what you're interested in, really. I mean, because people come from all walks of life into the in-house environment. Um, and in fact, while I was talking, I was trying to think of the backgrounds of my colleagues. Um, you know, I came from a firm environment where I did corporate tax and energy. Um, one of my other colleagues actually has a, um, a master's in fine arts. And um, she worked at a theater company before she actually came to BET in our business affairs department. And then she translated over into the legal affairs department. Um, we have a litigator. Actually, we have two litigators who, you know, came into to the legal affairs department. Um, and then we have an IP attorney. I mean, so it's really, I mean, all of us came from many different areas. And, um, you know, I guess I could venture to say that sometimes it has to do with the particular need of the legal affairs department at that time. Maybe they need a litigator, but I can almost guarantee you that that litigator will eventually <laughs> be doing, you know, some of the transactional work and some of the IP work, you know, at some point in time. So, um, I just do what you like and what you're good at. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, I apologize for asking this question beforehand. Um, I was hoping somebody else would answer it. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of us have student loans. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know if this is an appropriate question to ask, but like, how does the pay necessarily compare? Um, I'm, I'm assuming, from what I've heard, you have to have two or three years of experience in the law firm before corporations will really, really look at you as general counsel. So when you work up those three years, and then I guess, or say going into your fourth year, does the pay, the pay that you would get a law firm fourth year and the pay that you would get started on the corporate, yeah, I mean, I know, I'm sure it doesn't equal, but I guess are the benefits from better hours and less stress maybe, or doing something you love outweigh the pay, or is that why some people end up going back into the law firm because of the money? I was just wondering what, yeah. how that compares, I'm mean, not really sure. The so. money is totally different. And it's supposed to be a lifestyle choice, okay? And um, I mean, it, it is a lifestyle choice. I don't want to say it's supposed to be. Because even if you're working long hours, it, it, my, from my experience, even if you're working long hours as in-house counsel, it is a totally different ball game stress-wise <laughs> than it is in a firm environment. Um, so I'm trying to think of an example. Like I was told that, and this is based on New York, the salary that first-year associates are making is at, you know, sometimes, I guess in some corporations, comparable to what a, you know, vice president <laughs> would make. You know, I mean, it's, it's, there's a huge disparity. Huge. So, um, but one thing I did not mention earlier is that I firmly believe that coming out of law school, and going into a firm environment is a fantastic choice. I don't care what your goal is in the end, even if you decide that you don't want to practice law. I still think that it is a fantastic way to lay a foundation for anything. Um, you know, the work ethic, I, you know, the money. If you, you know, I mean, absolutely. I mean, hey, you could work at a law firm for, you know, tighten your belt, work at a law firm for three or four years and at least make a big dent, you know. Um, but beyond that, the training that you get is amazing. And you don't get that kind of training in an in-house environment. Because once you're in the in-house environment, they really expect you to, you know, hit the ground running, take ownership of your area of responsibility, and go with it. You know, there's no, you know, partner kind of overseeing what you're doing and explaining to you how they did something. You have to just go with it. So, um, that is why, you know, most corporations don't hire, you know, 
second year, third year. I mean, they're usually more like fourth and fifth year um, associates that they're looking to, to bring in. So lifestyle, stress level, totally different. But yeah, the money is, yeah. <laughs> and that, that can vary because if you, I mean, and I'm, I'm really speaking more on the entertainment side of things. I mean, if you go and work in-house at, you know, certain corporations, um, if you were to go in-house at a hedge fund or something like that, you absolutely can make big bucks. And sometimes you can make even more than you would make as an associate at a law firm based on bonuses. Now, your, your base level compensation will probably be less, but you have the potential to make a lot more. So it does depend. It does depend. But those jobs are also normally something that would come even a little later in your career. Yeah. Thank you. Elise first. Um, you had a larger firm. Sorry. Sorry. When you had a larger firm, and say you're on a transaction, and you're the junior person on a team of four, five, six, <coughs> how do you have significant client interaction, interaction that you know, the client will remember down the road when you do one make a connection right. to go in-house or to just do something else? It really depends on the partner or partners that you're working with. Um, and so that's why I do recommend that you really try to form some strong relationships, you know, just internally with your firm. Because if you can make an impression on a partner, that partner will trust you and will give you more latitude in terms of, you know, contact with their client. Um, but you really do have to gain the trust of the partners that you're working for. Um, it's difficult. I mean, you know, Truth be told, it can take, you know, depending on what area you're in, how large the firm you're, you're in, um, it can take years for you to really have direct and significant client contact. Um, but as long as you, you know, kind of make it known that that's what you'd like, as long as you ask questions and, you know, find out how you can get to that juncture, um, you'll get there. You just have to be, you know, Persistent, but also patient. You know, I'd say persistent internally, but then patient when it comes to, you know, I mean, if you're on a transaction as the junior person, you might be stuck in a room doing document review and due diligence. Um, but that is all incredibly valuable, you know, because the day that that partner asks you to actually come in and go down the due diligence list in front of the, the client is the beginning of your client contact. So you know, work from the inside out. <laughs> but um, you really, it's, it's a slow, steady process that you have to go through. Uh, two questions. One is um, where you are, how does employment law play into some of the attorneys, as in everything from wrongful termination to mm -hmm. from hours to wage to any kind of blood dispute? And then secondly, what's most remarkable? What is most rewarding uh, working in-house? Okay. Employment law is actually a very, very significant area, I would say, for any in-house legal department. And there certainly are plenty of employment law attorneys who come in-house. Um, you know, the same way I was kind of just lumping it into two areas, you know, transactional versus litigation. I mean, yes, absolutely, employment law would be a good focus. Um, I tend to find, however, that that is an area that um, ends up having opportunities really based on need. Like if you have a specific need, you, you know, your employment law attorney has gone. Um, they tend to focus their search on employment law attorneys, whereas I would say if they were looking for more of a generalist, they may not necessarily. They might go to something that is a little bit broader, like, you know, transactional work or litigation, because in those areas you can touch on, you know, a ton of different subject areas in those, you know, larger groupings. Um, so as an employment law attorney, you are definitely more specialized. Um, but the issues that really, you know, at least in my company, are dealt with by um, our HR department 
are you know, many and varied. And in fact, the person who heads up our HR department is a lawyer. Um, and he actually came through that path. He was hired in the, the legal department as the employment law attorney and then you know, has, has progressed to now head up the, the HR department. But all of us deal with employment law issues. Um, and I actually have had to learn a lot <laughs> about those various issues because I do, you know, as I said, anything that happens in relation to, you know, what's going on at this production facility, I have to at least vet. You know, I have to at least figure out where to go with it if I can't handle it myself. So um, that is a, a very good area, but I would say that you'd probably, you know, you'd probably end up with or end up seeing less specific opportunities um, than you would if you were in, you know, pursuing kind of a more general path. Um, and then what is most rewarding? Honestly, I love my job because I get to see the end result of all my hard work <laughs> on TV, you know, or online, or, you know, I mean, there is a concrete product that, you know, that everybody sees, you know. Um, and that's really, really a nice thing, especially after having come from a large firm environment where, you know, I mean, you could work on a transaction for years. And in fact, there were transactions that I worked on for the balance of my time at my firm since I was only there for two years that I never saw, you know, come to, to fruition in essence, you know. So it's nice that, you know, this is what I do is really discreet. Like I get, you know, I have to work on all these contracts for a show that's going to air next month. And then there it is. So I really do like that. Um, and I would say in conjunction with that, I like the fact that I do get to, you know, really be involved in the creative process. That's really, really a great perk of this job. And I think it's something that a lot of um, lawyers kind of lose sight of, that you, know, you do actually have to be creative. You have to figure out how to you know, fit the law around you know, either a business issue or a creative issue or vice versa. Um, so I really do think that the in-house environment lends you that ability a little bit more than you would necessarily get in you know, a firm environment. And just because you're right there, you know, you're in the in the midst of everything. So. I think we are going to have a break to let people. I know a bunch of us have breaks in the law at one o'clock, <laughs> but um, but please, I'm sure Kim doesn't mind staying after. Not at all. Um, please stay and, and ask questions. Um, I want to thank her so much for coming yeah. down. Thank you for having me. I also wanted to thank our sponsor, Fenwick and West. Um, they we were, were able to have this event because um, they, they made a very generous donation and they have um, sent materials for us up here. Come get a pen, a bookmark, um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.